How's everybody doing? Everybody doing all right? That lack of applause was because they remember me from 2012. I'm just letting you know that right now. So this is very exciting. Where are my Sam's people at, my Samers? Where are they at? How many principals came just because your Sam was going to be here because you know if they weren't going to be at your school, you wanted nothing to do with it? How many of you knew that right there? What is it? If we hire a, 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 if we, if a teacher's absent, we hire a sub. If the principal's absent, nobody even cares. <laughs> but if the Sam's absent, shut down the dang place. Isn't that exactly right? Sam person's gone, it becomes Camp Run Amok. Uh, so it is uh, uh, great to be here, and I'm very excited and looking forward to working with the group. And I didn't know if you all knew this or not, but I got a little inside skinny on the group that was going to be here today. I had been told what a dedicated group of educators were going to be here today, so I've been looking forward to this. And I'd been told what a caring group of educators were going to be here today, so I've been kind of pumped up about this. And I had been told what an intelligent group of educators were going to be here today. But i got to be honest with you. Nobody told me one single word about what an exceptionally good-looking group this was going to be today, and so that's a special treat. How many of you are pretty sure I was just talking about you? Okay, now here's the ultimate test. How many of you just tried to raise your hand and the person next to you tried to keep it down, by the way, so, so keep that in mind. No, I appreciate the nice introduction. I'm sure you all are thinking if, if this guy goes around and gets introduced like this all the time, his ego must get completely out of control and, and, and you'd be correct. But every once in a while, something happens that brings me down to earth and I had one of those occasions just a couple minutes ago. Happened to be in the men's room and a guy in there said to me, he goes, I hope you brought your reading material. I know, I, I thought reading material, I, I thought maybe he thought I was getting ready to go into one of the stalls, but <laughs> then I realized that wasn't it and I said, reading material? Why do you hope I brought my reading material? He said, well, I heard the speaker is dull, long-winded, and boring. I said, do you know who I am? <laughs> and he said, no. And I said, I'm the speaker. <laughs> and he said, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And he said, good, and ran out of the bathroom. So you have <laughs> things like that that bring you down to earth here now. Now, I had a chance to go around and meet some, a bunch of you last night and a bunch of you here this morning. And so I um, got a chance, and I know that there's some people that are in their first year in their roles. Uh, let's welcome them, their first year in their roles. And I know we have some first-year principals here. And uh, would the rest of the group mind if I took just a minute and shared some first-year principal advice? Would that, would that be okay here? Some of the veterans might want to jot down notes. That's your call. But anyhow, I was a high school principal when I was 25 years old. And I remember I met with my predecessor, and she gave me some advice that was very helpful and, you know, stuff like uh, you can rely on this person or be careful of them or make sure you watch this hallway. But she said, in addition, I have prepared three envelopes for you to use during your time here as principal. And I said, three envelopes? What on earth are you talking about? She said, for example, you will have a honeymoon period. And oftentimes that honeymoon period will last as long as five, sometimes even ten minutes. <laughs> she said, but then some deal's going to come along, a bigger deal than any deal you ever had to deal with and you will not know what to do. And when that happens, you need to run down to the office, close the door, open up the door, pull out envelope number one, and read what's inside. And she told me about envelope number two and envelope number three. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Anyhow, I got off to a great start. My honeymoon period, eight minutes flat. And then some deal came up, a bigger deal than any deal I ever thought I'd have to deal with, and I thought I will never resolve this problem. And I remembered envelope number one. So I ran down to the office, closed the door, opened up the door, pulled out envelope number one, and inside it said, blame your predecessor. <laughs> so that's what I see some veteran principals nodding aggressively at that particular piece of advice. Uh, the Sam's person might want to remind people you've used that one a couple times, so go ahead and uh, let's move on. But anyhow, anyhow, that solved the problem, made it through my first semester, got off to a great start my second semester. Everything was going well, and all of a sudden some other deal came up. A bigger deal than any deal I ever had to deal with my first semester, and I thought I will never resolve this problem. And then I remembered envelope number two. 
So I ran down to the office, closed the door, opened up the door, pulled out envelope number two, and inside it said, blame the superintendent. <laughs> and I see principals whose superintendent is not in the room nodding aggressively at that particular uh, piece of advice. Sure enough, that solved the problem. Made it through my first year, got off to a great start my second year. Everything was going well, and all of a sudden some other deal came up, a bigger deal than any deal I ever had to deal with my first year, and I thought I will never resolve this problem. And then I remembered envelope number three. So I ran down to the office, closed the door, opened up the door, pulled out envelope number three, and inside it said, prepare three envelopes. So I've always remembered that particular uh, piece of advice, if that, uh, that's helped there. Uh. I got to say something kind of exciting here. Uh, my wife and I had our 30th anniversary on Tuesday. They said Vegas took a big hit because most people had been betting the under. Uh, so anyhow, uh, that's a joke, under 30 years, if you didn't anyhow. So, um, my wife and I had a little tiff over the weekend, though, talking about an anniversary present. We had a little tiff, and I'm, I'm not going to say whose fault it is because some of you might tell her. But anyhow, <laughs> it was all over the silliest thing. You know, you have these over the silliest thing. You know what it was? I had a song stuck in my head, and I kept singing this song. And the whole weekend, I was singing this song at the top of my lungs. And anyhow, the song was I'm a Believer. You all know that song? What, the monkeys recorded it and then Smash Mouth covered it for the movie Shrek, isn't that right? And the whole weekend, I am walking around the house singing that song at the top of my lungs. The whole weekend, I'm walking around going, I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her. I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her. I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her. I'd pass my wife in the hallway. And I'd go, I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her. We go out to dinner with another couple. It's a nice restaurant, and I can't help myself. <laughs> They're asking me to pass them the salt, and I'm going, I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her. My wife told me to stop. Well, I thought she was kidding. <laughs> and then I saw her face. So anyhow, that is the... Stupidest joke I've ever thought of in my life right there, let me tell you. But I'm, I'm going to keep telling it because I think it's funny. <laughs> so anyhow, today we're going to talk about uh, rewiring your school culture. We're going to talk about leading change in your organization. We're going to talk about shifting your monkey. Also, we're going to throw a little of that in, which I know is a pay-per-view movie on the cable hotel system last night, but that's a completely different issue. Anyhow. For the Beavis people, I told you I was a butthead right there, didn't I? Just let me tell you that right there, so just keep that in mind. Anyhow, um, we're going to talk about bringing about change in your organization, positive change, and we're going to do it fast. You know, it's really interesting. How long do people say it takes to change the culture of an organization? What do the experts say? Three to five to seven years. How many of you have school-aged children? How many of you hope your child's school improves in three to five to seven year window? How many of you are shooting for that there? How many like it to be a lot faster than that? Do you know when people tell you it takes three to five to seven years, do you know what they're telling you? They don't know how. What they're saying is they don't know how. I'm just letting you know that. They're saying they don't know how. It's really an amazing thing here. How many of you would agree that every classroom in your school develops its own little culture? Its own little, how many of you would agree with that, okay? How many of you would agree that the worst teacher in your school's classroom develops a really strong culture? So how many of you agree with that? Okay. Let's say April 15th, the worst teacher in your school leaves, okay? So they've had about eight months to build up a culture in that school. At April 15th, the worst teacher in your school leaves. Into that classroom walks the best teacher in the school. Not a pretty good teacher, not a solid teacher, not a veteran teacher, uh, the best teacher in the school. In one week, what is that classroom like? Is it a little different or is it completely different? You know why? Because the teacher was stronger than the culture. Because the teacher was better than the culture. So understand that. Now, but I want you to be aware of something. It isn't like anybody can just change that culture. Because if that dysfunctional teacher on April 15th leaves and an average teacher walks in the room in one week, what is that classroom like? It's about the same, isn't it? Might be a little more organized. They might have the room rearranged. They might have the, the materials ready to be distributed and pass out. But you know what happens? That, strong, that, that teacher is stronger than the culture. I mean, the culture is stronger than the teacher. And you know what I want you to realize? 
if you're really good and you take over an organization, you want to know a little secret? You never see the before. Because people don't challenge new people to the same degree that they did the previous people unless the new people are also dysfunctional. And that's so important in terms of that dynamic that we've got to be able to do that. I want to share with you something here. You know, if you're a new principal, if you're brand new, if you're brand new to a school, it doesn't matter if it's your fifth school, you've been a principal, if you're brand new or a new superintendent, a new assistant superintendent, a new assistant principal, did you know the, the second you walk into that school, the second you walk into that school, the second you walk into that school, did you know the secretary wants, you to, wants to know how you want them to answer the phone? Did you all know that? Unless they're pathetic, they want to know how you want them to answer the phone. Because who do they want to please? You. Did you know they want to know how you want them to answer the phone until they answer the phone? Then they don't want to know how you want them to answer the phone. Because you know what you're doing now? You're correcting their behavior instead of establishing expectations. And that's a completely different way to look at the world. I love establishing expectations. I hate correcting behavior. But you know what's really funny? How many of you can follow the rules if you just know what the dang rules are? How many just want to know the rules of the game? How many work in organizations or states that feels like the game changes all the time? And then you don't know what to do. So we're going to focus on that and how to bring about that change much more quickly. One other thing I want to share with you is this. If there's any one thing I would like my principal friends to do, my assistant principal friends to do, my, assistant, my superintendents to do, my SAMers to do, I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to do more teaching, and I'd like you to do less telling. How many of y'all been told to raise your test scores? How many have been told to raise your test scores? How many have been holding back on that one? I'm just asking here random <laughs> questions here. How many of you like to leave a little slack in the line there in terms of that there? How many of you have your test scores up as high as you know how to get them? Let's see a show. How many of you have your test scores? Who doesn't? Everybody has their test scores up as high as you know how to get them. Because who benefits if your test scores go higher? You do. That's how come I know you have your test scores up as high as you know how to get them. Now, if I tell you to raise your test scores, how do you feel? Frustrated, angry, you'd want to disengage. But if I taught you to raise your test scores, what would you do? You'd be all over that in a second. When you wouldn't have any pushback at all. You'd actually welcome it. Well, what I've learned is we've got to do more teaching and we've got to do less telling. Does anybody here deal with bus discipline? Isn't bus discipline almost like a festival? I consider bus discipline like a Mardi Gras with less beads. That's how dang much fun bus discipline is. Now, what is, bus discipline's hard. What is it that makes bus discipline so hard? You don't have the slightest idea what happened. Do you know what else makes bus discipline so hard? Neither does the bus driver. <laughs> but I got a question for you. How many of you work with at least one teacher that has trouble managing 25 kids sitting in front of them? And we whine about the fact a bus driver can't manage 66 kids behind him while they're driving a school bus. Now, I know their salaries are astronomical, and I know their training's rich and deep. But do you know something? We have a choice, folks. We can either teach the bus drivers how to manage kids, or we can whine about the fact the bus drivers don't know how to manage kids. And I know what about 95% of the principals do. Guess which of those two they do? They whine. Now, you might be thinking, Todd, we got a transportation director. They ought to teach the bus drivers how to manage kids. Sure they ought to. But they don't. And you know why they don't? There's two reasons. One is, there's a really good chance they don't have any idea how to teach the bus drivers how to manage kids. But the other is, they don't have to deal with discipline. See, if I don't have to deal with the discipline of the bus drivers, I don't really care if the bus drivers can manage kids or not. Does that make any sense? But if I have to deal with the bus discipline, I care a lot if the bus drivers can manage kids. Well, I'm 25, I'm a high school principal, and I start getting bus reports. You know what I think? Oh, no. Oh, no. This isn't going to get any easier. It isn't like their relationships are magically going to heal. Instead, it's going to get worse. So what do you do? So every day when the buses would pull in, I'd get on those buses. And I know you're thinking, wait a minute, time. I'm telling you about time. Let me tell you something. You can either do something about your ineffective people, or you can keep defending them for the rest of your life. That's your choice on time. Let me tell you this. How many of you would be willing to bet me money you could predict which teacher in your school will send the most kids to the office in the 2019-2020 school year? <laughs> 
And do you see, if you don't do anything about these people, what happens is you keep reacting to the same nonsensical things all the time. Two of my first books, my very first book was dealing with difficult teachers because it's the single hardest thing to do. You talk about free in time, how about you do something about them? How about you get rid of your worst teacher and you bring in the best teacher in the school? Is that going to change your school any? You want to change your school quick, that's the quickest thing you can do. You got two ways to improve your school. Don't kid yourself, folks. You only got two ways to improve your schools. You know the only two ways to improve your schools? Hire better teachers and improve the ones you got. And if you think it's something else, you're just chasing your tail. I'm just letting you know that right there. And what's funny is one of my next books was dealing with difficult parents. And people ask me all the time, Todd, what's the difference between dealing with difficult teachers and dealing with difficult parents? And why'd you write dealing with difficult teachers for you wrote dealing with difficult parents? And it's actually incredibly simple. You want to know the biggest difference between dealing with difficult teachers and dealing with difficult parents? If you don't have any difficult teachers, it's incredible how few difficult parents you have. And if you're blessed with just one difficult teacher, just one, you're going to be very fortunate and have plenty of difficult parents again next year and the next year and the next year and the next. So let's not lose sight about where we make a change. And that's so important in terms of this in our dynamic. Anyhow, I start getting bus discipline. I, start, I get on the buses and I uh, get on every bus and I go, hey, how's your day going? You know what that bus driver tells me? That Johnny Tucker's killing me. You know what I tell that bus driver? That Johnny Tucker's killing me too. I go, he's a deal, isn't he? What's the bus driver say? Yeah, he's a deal. I go, I don't know what to do with him. What's the bus driver say? I don't know what to do with him either. I said, you know something funny? The other day I walked by Johnny's class. I looked in there. I couldn't believe what he was doing. Bus driver goes, I can only imagine. I go, I know. Shocked me too. You know what he was doing? He was doing something. I couldn't believe he was doing something called behaving. I couldn't believe, I assumed the teacher must have slipped him a Mickey. I couldn't believe she got him to behave like that. And I asked the teacher, tell me about Johnny Tucker. You know what she told me? He's a deal. I go, yeah, he's a deal. I go, how do you get him to behave? You know what that teacher told me she does? She used to something, she called it, what did she call him? Think here. She called it a, she called it a seat and chart. I said, I've never heard of a seating chart. Have you ever heard of a seating chart? <laughs> Folks, I got a question for you. If the bus driver's heard of a seating chart and I've never heard of a seating chart, who's smarter? The bus driver. And if neither one of us have heard of a seating chart, do you see how we're equally dumb and we're learning together? Folks, if you've read any of my books and they're all the same thing, and I know you feel blessed if you've just ordered two, but do you know, <laughs> if you know have read any of my books, you know what my books are? How do you get people to do what it is you want them to do? Can I tell you a secret? That's all I know. Can I tell you another secret? That's all I need to know. The best teacher in your school can get the students to do anything. The worst teacher in your school can't get the students to do anything. The best principals in this room can get their teachers to do anything. The worst principals can't get their teachers to do anything. The best superintendents can get their school boards to do anything. The worst superintendents can't get their school boards to do anything, no matter how many districts they move to. The best parents can get their kids to do anything even when they're not looking, and the worst parents can't get their kids to do anything even when they are looking. Folks, it's that ability to influence. And understand this, that's all I know. That is it. That's all I know. But once you have that, it's a gift that you can just use in any situation forever. And you can teach it to other people. It's really a funny thing. Any read the book Shift and the Monkey? It's the funniest thing. I presented a lot of national conferences and stuff, and people will bring their, their, their spouse, their partner, or both if they're gutsy. But anyhow... Um, you don't need to raise your hand on that one back there. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, it's funny, and this is not a gender thing. If I use a male or female example, it's just arbitrary. Anyhow, I'll be at a national conference, and you know, their spouse or partner will be with them, whatever, and they'll go, my husband loves the book Shifting the Monkey. Loves it, loves it, loves it, loves it. Talks about it all the time. Loves the book Shifting the Monkey. I go, have you read it? And they go, no, and I go, you'd better. And they'll write me and they'll go, they've been doing that to me. I said, I told you you'd better. So my Sam people here, read it. You'll be in complete control of your principle if you're not already. I'm just letting you know that right there, anyhow. You know what's really interesting is, I want you to think about this. When I first mentioned the seating chart, is the bus driver at all intrigued? Do you know instead what happens is we approach people like we're superior. We need to approach people like we're inferior, we're learning from them, or at best, we're on an equal plane. 
if you find yourself using power, you've lost. Folks, the things we talk about here, they'll influence your teachers, they'll influence your superintendent, they'll influence your school board, they'll influence your night custodian. There's not a power involved. As soon as you feel power, you're lo you've lost. I'm just letting you know that. How do most people approach bus drivers? Do you know something you should be doing that I've been using for years, and by the way, I get paid more than you and smell less like exhaust? That's what happens. That's why people want to put kick me stickers on your back. <laughs> Folks, I don't know nothing. I've never learned anything. You know what I learned? I've learned it from you. Where are my elementary friends here? Is parent pick up and drop off a slight issue in any of your schools? I'm asking completely <laughs> random questions here. If you'd like to change parent pick up and drop off, how do average principals and average schools do it? They send out a note that says something like this. Here are the new parent pick up and drop off procedures. You know what you're really saying? Here's something I'm gonna shove down your throat that you're not gonna like, just like the last thing we shoved down your throat here at school. You know how you make it softer? You say a couple of parents had, asked, had, had made some gr gr great suggestions involving parent pick up and drop off, and they made so much sense, we've decided to go ahead and give those a try. So here, do you see how much that, I'm, I'm a servant leader now. I've never said, teachers, here's the new guidelines. You know what I say? A couple of you had suggested over the summer, and this is an incredible idea. And so do you see the difference there? How much more acceptable that is to people? Anyway, I mentioned the seat and chart. I go, you ever heard of this seat and chart? The bus driver's hamming and hawing. Because even if he's heard of a seat and chart, it doesn't matter because he's not using it effectively. And anyhow, I asked that teacher, I go, tell me about this seat and chart deal. She told me she puts Johnny Tucker in the deluxe seat right up there by her desk. And she leaves empty seats around him, or she puts other kids around him who won't interact with him. She said it's really helped his behavior. I go, I never even thought about this. What do you think about this? But the bus driver's stumbling around because there's another factor going on. And never doubt this other factor. Do you know the other factor that's going on? That bus driver's scared of Johnny Tucker. Who's actually been driving the bus for the first six weeks of the school year? <laughs> Maybe now it's almost six months of the school year. Johnny Tucker. He's scared of Johnny Tucker. And you know what I say to him? I go, I don't know nothing about this seat and chart deal. I go, but I'd love to fool with one sometime. If you know of any bus drivers that would ever let me get on the bus and assign the kids seats. Now, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But if you know of any bus drivers that would ever let me get on the bus and assign the kids seats, just let me know because I'd love to give it a crack. But I don't want to step on any bus driver's toes. Does he know any bus drivers that would like me to get on the bus? How many bus drivers does he know for sure? One. When do you want me on the bus? Now, but I won't get on the bus now. You know why? Because there's no students on the bus. Because you know what else he's got to see? How you treat the kids, how you talk to the kids. I'm 25 and I'm a high school principal. This is way before drop-in supervision or any of this kind of stuff. You know why I went in classrooms every single day? Because the good teachers liked it and the poor teachers didn't. I wish I could be smart and sophisticated. I'm not. Good teachers liked it and the poor teachers. Anything good people like and bad people don't, I do as often as I possibly can. <laughs> Folks, I've learned you can't improve anybody's performance from the office, and we've been trying that one for years, hadn't we? That's part of what the SAMS is all about, isn't it? You know the other reason I'm in classrooms every single day, folks? So see, people see how we treat the kids. They hear how we talk to kids. They hear us say please and thank you and ladies and gentlemen, and they need to hear that every day because otherwise they don't get it. You know the other reason I'm in classrooms every day? Because I can defend teachers so much more by being in classrooms every day. I'm very different, folks. People don't quit their jobs, they quit their bosses. Nobody leaves for $2,000. They tell you they leave for $2,000 because they don't want to say you're a jerk. But people don't quit their jobs. They quit their bosses. Understand that. And folks, you've got to defend people more than anybody else. It's amazing. If I get a call from a parent complaining about a teacher, they're using clip up, clip down as a discipline. You all know what clip up, clip down is? And I have a call from a parent who's complaining about this teacher using clip up, clip down. They're going, that parent's picking on my kid. Clip up, clip down all the time. They're just clipping him down all the time. I don't like this clip up, clip down. They're picking on the kid all the time. I don't like this clip up, clip down. I want them to stop this clip up, clip down. Guess what I say to the parent? Um, I, I make her do that. I, I require her to do that. She has to do clip up, clip down. I make her do that. Who did I take the pressure off of? Do you see the difference there? Have I escalated the parent? But have I completely taken that parent where all of a sudden now they don't think of that teacher in a negative way? You know I'm in classrooms every day so I can talk about what I know instead of what I don't know. Teacher sends a kid to the office, you call the parent. And the parent's going, yeah, she's picking on my boy all the time. They're picking on my boy all the time. Last week that teacher did this, the week before the teacher did this, right now who has all the power? The parent. 
What am I going to do? Take away that power. I'm just I'm going to take away that power in one second. And you know what I'm going to say? I'm sorry, I don't know anything more about this but what I told you today. You know one of the tough things is, Mrs. Smith, you and I weren't there. Is that the truth? You and I weren't there. Have I immediately taken away her power? But I say, you know what? I don't know anything more about this today than what I've shared, but can I tell you something? Last week when I was in her classroom, your son did this and this and this, and I would have sent him to the office last week. And she didn't send him to the office last week, but I would have sent him to the office last week. So it makes me shudder to think what happened today because I would have sent him to the office last week. Who did I make out to be a hero? Do you see how we do this? Do you see how you build up loyalty? I learned this as a principal. I hired a, I'm, I'm in my 20s, I'm in my second school. I hired an assistant principal, Dale Lumpa, one of the best friends ever. Dale Lumpa passed away recently from lung cancer, a fitness expert, unbelievably sad, younger than I am. And anyhow, um, uh, I'd hired him as an assistant principal. It probably the third week of school. Uh, some man mountain parent, you know, one of those intimidating people comes walking, trying to be intimidating, he's an idiot, you know what I mean, bang, he comes walking into school. <laughs> and he's walking and he goes, where's that Mr. Lumpa? Where's that Mr. Lumpa? He ain't fair. He's picking on my boy. He ain't fair. Where's that Mr. Lumpa? He ain't fair. Where's that boy? He's picking on Mr. Lumpa. He's suspended my boy three days. This ain't fair. I never want my boy seeing that Mr. Lumpa again. I'm sitting in my office. I can hear this. And you know what I'm thinking? Crap, he's not here. So I walk out there and I go, hi, Todd Whitaker, principal here, how can I help you? And he goes, where's that Mr. Lump? He ain't fair. I never want my boy seeing Mr. Lump again. He suspended him three days. This ain't fair. Never want him seeing my boy again. I knew his boy. His boy was going to be seeing Mr. Lump again. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> to save time, we anointed a chair with a nameplate and put it right there in my Mr. Lump's office. Let me just tell you that with his son's name on it. And then I go, tell me what happened. You know what's funny? He's out there yelling, ranting and raving, and there's three secretaries watching. And guess where I'm handling that parent? Right there. Because you know what I want those secretaries to see? We're not afraid of parents, folks. We're not going to act tough. We're, not gonna, we're just not afraid of parents. Nothing wrong with being afraid, only something wrong with acting afraid. And you know what else I want them to see? How we treat people, how we deal with people. Otherwise, they've got to figure it out on their own. The people that can figure it out on their own have already figured it out on their own. How many got a couple teachers that have figured it out on their own? How many got a couple teachers never going to figure it out on their own? And you know what every teacher in your school does? I promise you this. Every teacher in every school, do you know what they do? They do something called the best they know how. And if you ever question that, all you have to do is think of classroom management. Do you know how I know every teacher in your school does the best, at class, the, the best they know how at classroom management? Because classroom management is selfish. If any of us could get the kids to behave better, what would we do? How many of y'all been holding back on that one? I'm just asking you. How many have something where you're going with some improved test scores, build better relationships with parents, and improve student behavior, and I'll bring that in in 2022? We don't do that, do we? We go ahead and bring it in right away. This weekend, if you are at home by yourself and you go in your family room to watch TV, this weekend, if you are at home by yourself and you go in your family room to watch TV, did you know you will never, ever sit in the second most comfortable chair? Do you know where you always sit? That most comfortable chair. How many of you work with teachers that sit behind their desk too much? You know why they sit behind their desk so much? Most people think it's because they're lazy. It's not just because they're lazy. It's because they're scared to death of students, folks. They don't know what to do on the other side of the desk. And can I tell you a little secret? We don't want them on the other side of the desk until we teach them what to do on the other side of the desk. My theory is let's keep that pus back there until we drain it. That's my theory right there, let me tell you. That pus comment's kind of gross, isn't it, now that you think about it? <laughs> do, you know, do you know that pus comment's only gross until your own child would happen to get that teacher? And then that pus comment's the least of your concerns. Do you know what your concern is now? That your child has that teacher. That's the reason we're in classrooms every single day, folks. We're not there for you. We're there for the students in that class. How many of you have a couple teachers in your school? You know that at the start of this year, a couple of the kids didn't have a chance. I don't even know how we can live with ourselves. That's why you're there. Otherwise, we don't even need a principal. That's why you're there, to make sure every kid has an outstanding. It's funny, I had a Twitter chat the other day. I hope everybody's on Twitter. You've got to be on Twitter. If you're not, you're so far behind the world. It's incredible. I'm talking about in professional development. One person clapped. There's one person up with the world. Anyhow, what's interesting is 
They had a Twitter chat the other day about parental involvement in schools, and it was so complicated. I'm not smart enough to catch on to what they were saying, all sorts of terms. I'm sure it was really good. I said, you want to have really good parental involvement in schools, parental relationships with schools? Why don't you make sure every single kid has a really good teacher? It's amazing. If every kid has a really good teacher, you've got great parental relations with schools, don't you? And if every kid doesn't have a really good teacher, you can't possibly have great parental relations in schools, can you? And you know what? People want to parents more, more connected at school. I want parents more connected at home. That's great if they're connected at school, but they have to be connected at home. That's the difference, folks. That's great if they come to a parent conference, but if they're engaged at home, it doesn't even matter if they come to the parent conference. I'd like them to, but that's bonus, isn't it? That's not what we really need. And be honest, your worst teachers don't even want the parents to come to parent-teacher conference. They don't want them there, and then they love to use it as a weapon when they don't come. What am I supposed to do with the kid? The parents don't even come to parent-teacher conference. I mean, isn't that what they do? <laughs> anyway, I tell that bus driver, I go, I can't get on the bus right now. I got something to do. Uh, school gets out at 3 o'clock, I'll get on the bus at 2.45. He said, that'd be fine. I get on at 2.45, I got 15 minutes to teach that bus driver something. You know what I got 15 minutes to teach that bus driver to do? Think. Doesn't mean he's not smart, he's just never thought about this. So I get on the bus at 2.45 and I go, who's the worst kid on the bus? He said, Johnny Tucker. I go, who's the wor next worst kid on the bus? He said, uh, he tells me, who's the next worst kid? He tells me, who's the next worst kid? I go, okay, here's your four worst kids. Which of those kids is on the bus the longest? Should that have anything to do with where they sit? Which of those kids is on the bus the shortest? Are there some that only ride intermittently? Are there some that only ride mornings or afternoons? Should all of this come into play? How many work with some bus drivers never going to figure this out on their own? How many work with some principals that are never going to figure out their bus drivers are never going to figure this out on their own? <laughs> Anyhow, he and I come up with a seating chart. The bell rings at 3 o'clock, and he gets to hear how I talk to Johnny Tucker. He gets to hear how I get the challenging kids to do exactly what it is I need the challenging kids to do. He gets to hear how I talk to the nice kids. He gets to hear how I interact with all the kids. We get all the kids in seats. That night, he, the kids go home, and they behave better than they've ever behaved in his entire career. The next morning, the kids get in their seats. They come in, and they behave better than they've ever behaved in his entire career. He walks in the bus barn, and what's he tell all the other bus drivers about? His idea. That's exactly right. He goes, yep, you know something I've been using for years? Yeah, something called a seating chart? Yep. And you know what I did this year? I tricked that city slicker principal, the one with all the moose in his hair. I tricked him into getting on the bus and assigning all the kids seats, and then I didn't have to do it. And I bet you could trick him too. Guess what all the bus drivers tricked me into doing? How many times do I need to do this with a bus driver? Once, isn't that amazing? This was in Hopkins, Missouri for my Missouri friends there. That's a lot of Hopkins people right over there, let me tell you. That's actually the mayor, I'm pretty sure. I'm not positive. Anyhow, uh, and you know what? Some of those bus drivers are still driving buses in Hopkins, Missouri. And you know what they're doing when a new bus driver gets started? Yep, you know what we do around here? Something called a seat and chart. Yep, and what we do, that's changing your culture, folks. We used to have bus driver celebrations four times a year. Called them bus, they were bus driver breakfast. And you know what's really funny? Your cooks love cooking for bus drivers because that's their peer group. Their peer group's bus drivers. It's not school board members. They don't even want to cook for school board members. They want to cook for bus drivers. We'd have pigs in a blanket, Belgian waffles. It was the greatest thing I ever seen in my life right there, let me just tell you. Anyhow, we'd have a bus driver celebration. And then you know what I do? I do something called a five-minute end service. I called it my five-minute end service to myself, not to them, because I want them to come. You want to change the culture of your school? Don't talk about culture. It's got to come through the back door. You mentioned culture. Culture gets stronger and resistant immediately. It doesn't want to change. That's what culture is. Folks, you got to come through the back door. I'll get a call and somebody go, Todd, could you come and do a workshop for our school on team building? I go, sure. Why don't we call it team building? And that way everybody can vomit at the same time. <laughs> Instead, why don't we just come, do a team building activity, and then reflect on what it meant to be able to work together. Do you see the difference there? There's so much more influence being able to do that. Anyhow, um, uh, we'd have a five-minute in-service. That's where the book 10-minute in-service. I was scared to call it five-minute in-service because I thought that same 10-minute in-service seems hokey. The Hollywood diet, what, you lose 38 pounds in two days? Somehow I think that involves a toilet. That's just my guess there. I'm not positive, but I'm guessing it does. You all know exactly what I'm talking about there. I can tell that one there. Anyhow, so anyhow. Uh, anyhow, I, I tell the bus drivers and I go, you know what I talk to the bus drivers about? I thank them for their service and then you know what I talk about? Something I saw one of them do. 
I never talk about anything I know. Something I saw one. You got bus drivers are amazing. You know what one of y'all told me the other day? I never even thought about this. Where do you come up with this stuff? You guys are amazing. You see, nobody came up with this. Nobody told me. But look at how much more influential that is. Does that make any sense? And I go, you know what you told me? You told me you used to, if a kid was acting up on the way home, you'd pull the bus over and lecture the kid. And then you said, you know what you realize? You're punishing the kids for being good. The kids that aren't acting out have to be on the bus longer. You know who else you're punishing? You, because now you're stuck with that kid even longer. And you know what you realize? It's better just to take the kid on home. The next day, get all the kids on the bus, bring them in, let all the kids go. But that kid, now you deal with that kid on his time instead of dealing with that kid on everybody else's time. You said it's changed the thing so much. You go, you hate the kid. You don't want to keep him on the bus any longer than you have to. said on the last day of school, you don't even come to a complete stop. <laughs> you just have the kid tuck and roll. I mean, that's just an amazing thing there in terms of this. And I want you to be aware of something, folks. Guess what all the other bus drivers start doing? They're going, you know what? I used to pull over and lecture the kids. I realize now that's pretty stupid. Where did I learn it from? Another bus driver. See how much more acceptable that is. Folks, I want you to be aware of something. Culture doesn't take three to five to seven years, but I want you to be aware of something. If tomorrow, just tomorrow, you're enthusiastic at work, that's climate. If you never stop being enthusiastic at work, that's culture. The day it becomes, moves from climate to culture, I'm not smart enough to tell you. But you know what's interesting? I don't know when culture changes, but I know when it starts changing, it starts changing tomorrow. And be aware of one other thing. You want to change student behavior, you've got to change adult behavior. Don't waste your time trying to change student behavior. Start changing adult behavior. And that's so important in terms of that. It's really funny. Let's just talk about this here, changing this culture. How many of y'all grew up with a, a, a around the supper? How many grew up eating supper around the supper table? Okay. How many of you at your supper table had a, a emotionally reserved seating? Okay. How many of you did the conversation at the supper table depend on the mood of one main person in there in the family there? Okay. The power player. Okay. Now, I got a question for you here. Everybody's got their assigned seats. One day, your older brother or sister's boyfriend's girlfriend or friend comes and joins you at supper. Do people behave differently? That's right. Your little brother puts on his shirt. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> you're hoping your grandma does too this time. Anyhow, and uh, uh People say please and thank you. They're a little bit more polite. They pass stuff instead of just reaching and grabbing. There's less belching going on. Am I right? That's climate. Now, when that person who came to supper that night leaves the next day, do you see how, what do we do? We immediately go back to where we were. That's climate because it was only climate that was changed. You know who's going to join your family now? Your favorite aunt. You know how long your favorite aunt's going to be there? Three weeks. Not three to five to seven years, three weeks. Which aunt is it? It's your favorite aunt. Is there a difference between your favorite aunt and all the other aunts? This isn't the one that needs to shave. This is the favorite aunt. Okay. <laughs> how many of you have at least one relative that's different than all the other relatives in your family? <laughs> Understand this. Understand the power of these people. This is so important. If you read what great principles do differently, you understand the difference between superstars, backbones, and mediocres. And if you don't understand that dynamic, you are so behind in leadership, it's incredible. You're so behind in leadership. Folks, superstars are the only ones that always want the principal to succeed. They always want the principal to succeed because how big is their vision? How many of you work with at least one teacher that would like it if they're in a bad mood, if they could make the principal cry? How many work with at least one teacher if they're in a bad mood, they'd like it if they could make the new pretty young teacher who's better than they are cry? Folks, understand peer relations. You've got to work on that. Where are my elementary friends again? How many of you have at least one teacher that can't wait to tell next year's teachers about the kids they're going to get? You do understand they're rooting against you, don't you? They're hoping that they, you won't have any success next year either, don't you? You do understand that. You know who else they're rooting against? The kids. They're hoping to ruin that teacher's summer, and they're hoping that kid doesn't learn anything next year either. You know why you better have teachers on Twitter? You know what I saw? In new, how many of you have new teachers in your school? How many of you have talked to him about new teacher chat? Every other Wednesday has been going on for five years. New teacher from all over the world. You know what? You seem like an instructional leader if you can just talk to people about Twitter. You really do. How many of you have seen the tweet, the 100 best educational YouTube clips of all grade levels and subjects? How many of you have seen that? How many of you wish you'd seen that? How many of you had seen that and just shared it with your teachers? You'd look like an instructional leader and it'd take you five seconds to do it. New teacher chat. You know what I saw in new teacher chat last April? A new teacher, 22-year-old first-year teacher, because I wrote her and asked. I wanted to make sure. You know what she put on Twitter chat? Colleagues, 
I don't want to hear about the students I'm going to have next year because they didn't have me this year. And that's great, but peers shouldn't have to stand up to their peers. That's the principal's job. Do you know what your teacher's job is? To do what's right even when their peers do wrong. That's a high enough standard. How many of you have children? How many expect your children to fix their friends? How many expect your children to do what's right even when their friends do wrong? And you understand if your children do what's right even when their friends do wrong, that does fix some of their friends. It gives them an excuse not to do the wrong thing. Anyhow, your favorite aunt comes and joins the family. She's going to be there for three weeks. It's the favorite aunt. The first night at the supper table, your favorite aunt's there first. And you know where she's sitting? The power player's chair. What does everybody do? Folks, they don't go, <gasps> do you know why they don't go, <gasps> because it's the favorite aunt. If it was the loser aunt, they'd make a move. They'd let them sit at the kids' table at the little table in the corner. It's the favorite aunt, so what does everyone do? Accommodates them. Do you see the difference between the favorite aunt and everybody else? You want to change your culture? You start with two groups, your best teachers and your new teachers. You start with your best teachers because they'll do it and they'll do it right. You start with your new teachers because it's not new to them. Do you know when induction starts of new teachers? Do you know when induction starts? The interview. I can push you farther and faster in a five-minute interview than I can push you in five years in my school. Because the leverage is so different. Does that make any sense? You want a job in my school? I like teachers in each other's classrooms. You have to be. You have to get your teachers in each other's classrooms. I'm writing a book called How to Get All Teachers to Be Like the Best Teachers because that's the only solution I can think of. In every one of your schools, one of your teachers has cracked the Da Vinci Code, haven't they? No matter what your poverty level, no matter how many of you have at least one teacher, they have cracked the Da Vinci Code. They have figured it out. You know what you need? You just need all the teachers to become like that teacher. You don't need a new mystery result. This is all you need. How do we replicate it? Well, one way is get teachers in each other's classrooms. And you don't mandate. You can't mandate effectiveness. Folks, if you force people in each other's classrooms, if that's how you start, somebody's going to hurt somebody's feelings. They're going to go in that new teacher's classroom who's really good, and you know what they're going to say? I thought your lesson was good, but is it me, or do you look a little puffy? I mean, that's what they're going to say there. If all your teachers go in each other's classrooms in a non-judgmental, non-evaluative way, you know what happens? All the teachers become like the best teachers. Nobody steals a worse idea. You don't come to a Sam's conference and go, I don't think that'll work as well as what I do. I give a, I'm going to give it a crack. You don't do that, do you? And you know when this starts? New teachers. And when does it start? During the interview. Because it's not new to them. And you know what you say during the interview? What would you think about possibly if I could get a sub or cover your class for you or figure something else out? If you went in a couple of the best teachers' classrooms and you just stole ideas from them and then they came in yours and it was kind of a mutual swap, what would you think about that? You'd like a job in my school. What do you think about that? It's the best idea you've ever heard of. I don't talk about new. I don't talk about experimental. I don't say you're going to be a guinea pig. I make new seem normal. They start school the very first day and what do they say? When do we do the swap? When do we start the swap? And how do you start it with your veteran teachers? You know what you do? Don't you already know in the spring if you're going to have a couple openings? You don't know who you've hired yet, but potentially you know you're going to have a couple openings. You know what you say during your spring, one of your spring faculty meetings? Folks, we have so many talented people in this room. It's incredible. Looks like we're going to have four or five new teachers next year. You know what I'd love for them to do? I'd love for them to be able to come into your classroom and just steal ideas. And you go in their room so it's like a mutual swap so we don't go in the drink the, from the fountain of Georgia Humphrey's knowledge. You know, that it's kind of a mutual swap thing. So if anybody would be willing to do that, let me know over the next couple weeks. Why do I not ask for volunteers right there? Because if I ask for volunteers right there, who's under pressure? Which teachers? The high achievers. And you know what happens? They raise their hand, and you know what people are saying? Oh, good, the kiss butts are doing it. I don't have to do it. <laughs> Folks, a superstar cannot be a superstar if they're not respected by their peers. They, they can never be perceived as the principal's pet, but they'd better be the principal's pet. But if they're perceived as a principal's pet, they ruin their, you've ruined their influence too. Uh, you've ruined their ability to influence others. What I ask is let me know part, because what I, in my school, I make it a dynamic in which everybody's doing it but you. And in most schools, nobody's doing it but the goody two-shoes. And instead, I want the people that aren't doing it to feel the pressure. I don't want the people who are doing it to feel the pressure. Do you see the difference there in that dynamic? Anyhow, the best uh, favorite aunt sits there and everybody accommodates them. Do people behave differently that very first night at the supper table? But they would have if it was an older brother or sister's boyfriend, girlfriend, or friend, too. But you know what happens there? Everybody's talking and all this stuff. And you know what the favorite aunt says? Because you always have dessert. You know what the favorite aunt says at the start of dessert? I love this family so much. 
You know what would be neat? If every night at dessert we could share three things that happened during our day, because I want to hear so much and understand what your daily life is like, because I don't get to be around you near as much as I'd like to. I just love this family so much, and that way I can always envision what your day is like. As soon as she says that, what does everybody in the family do? Immediately looks down, isn't that right? And the favorite aunt says, would you care if I go first? Why does the favorite aunt say, would you care if I go first? One reason is to give you time to think. The other reason is to role model, because potentially you all don't function in that fashion in which you're open and sharing. The favorite aunt's first story is she went to the store and she couldn't find her way to the store and she got lost and she was driving all around. She could not find her way to the store. Finally, she got to the store and then she couldn't find her way home. And she was just driving all around. She's laughing at herself, making fun of herself. She gets home and guess what? She left her glasses at the store and she couldn't find her way to the store again. And she couldn't find her way to the store and your aunt's laughing and who else is laughing? Everybody at the table, can I tell you a secret about laughter? Laughter is a gateway to emotion. When people laugh, they're much more likely to be able to be pulled in emotionally. Never discount that. A great teacher isn't funny, a great teacher's fun. There's a difference between those two things. Her second story is about The Price is Right. She was watching The Price is Right on TV. She still misses Bob Barker, but she's glad that Drew carries on. At least he's lost weight and now he's heart healthy. And anyhow, uh, but she still spays and nudes her pet, pet in honor of Bob Barker. Anyhow, um, they were playing the game Polenko and the chip got stuck on the top of the Polenko game. And Drew Carey started laughing, the contestants started laughing, the audience started laughing, your aunt started laughing, and the whole table started and you know what her third story is? It's a story about your younger brother. Because your younger brother brought, him, her, brought her his teddy bear. And she said, whenever I stay at a strange house, I always take my teddy bear so I don't feel as scared. So I thought since you're here at a strange house, I thought you might want my teddy bear. Next at your older brother's term, he passes. What a loser. He passes. Your sister said a kid vomited at school, can only come up with one thing. Your dad said traffic was bad, but somehow you stumble through it. It's the second night, the second day of supper, the second day. Your favorite aunt's down at the table last. What seat's left open? The power player's chair. Would they have done it for anybody else but the favorite aunt? Do you understand the importance of this, of the favorite aunt? Do you understand the importance of your superstar? They're the only ones that can move your school. Don't kid yourself. They're the only ones that can move your school. Don't kid yourself, folks. What's funny is they've started to accommodate the ant. How many days has this taken? Two. I thought it took three to five to seven years. Oh, anyhow, but anyhow. The very first thing she says at supper is, I can't wait to hear everybody's three things during dessert. Why does she say it at the start of supper? To give you time to think. You know what else she says? Would you mind if I went first again? You know why she said that? Because she knows your family's dysfunctional, and she's got to take a little more time in teaching you how to communicate properly. She tells another story making fun of herself. She tells another story about something funny she saw on, saw on TV, and you know what her third story is about? It's about you, because it's something you did that was nice. And you know why you did it? Because your kissed butt brother got some positive attention. You want some attention, too. She tells a story about how you brought her your favorite afghan, because your favorite afghan is so snugly and warm, and she wanted to make sure she was snugly and warm here at the house. The second night, everybody shares at least one thing, and a couple people even share three. How long does it take to change a culture? I can't remember. Is there a difference between the favorite aunt and all the other aunts? Is there a difference between how we'd act if it was the favorite aunt and all the other aunts? Don't kid yourself. That third night at the supper table, do you have a new emotionally reserved seating? Is there any question where the favorite aunt sits? The power player's on a stool. I mean, isn't that maybe sitting like this on a stool? We have new emotionally reserved seating. The third night, the aunt goes, I can't wait to hear everybody's three things. What does someone say? Can I go first? How long does it take to change the culture? I can't remember. And can I tell you something? Your family culture is way more solid than a school culture. Your family culture's had 17 years around the supper table with the exact same people. A school culture, people come and go. Somebody goes, can I go first? And you know what people start sharing stories about? The aunt. See, they're not comfortable to share nice stories about our brother and sister or relatives. That's a risk, because we're used to being made fun of. We used to say it and somebody goes, loser, and somebody goes, I mean, that's what happens there. But will they do that about the favorite aunt? Because understand, if they say something positive about the fam aunt, favorite aunt and somebody else makes fun of it, what will the favorite aunt say? I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And now who feels small? The one that told it or the one that made fun of them? Because it's the favorite aunt. You know what the stories start being about? Something the favorite aunt did. See, the favorite aunt started getting up and helping making lunch. You know why the favorite aunt started making lunch? Because she wanted to be up and see everybody in the morning because I just don't get to see you all that often. She starts making you lunch every day. And you know what their story is about? Something your favorite aunt did in lunch. 
Your little brother talks about the, one of his three things was a favorite aunt put a post-it note in his bag that said, you're my favorite nephew. He's not smart enough to know he's the only nephew. It's really irrelevant there in terms of that, but it made him feel important. And you know what one of your three things is? Your favorite aunt put a note in your lunch that said, I uh, cut your peanut butter and jelly sandwich diagonally because it keeps the flavor in longer. You have children. How do you cut their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? How do you cut them now? Diagonally. Why? And they're going to raise kids, and they're going to do what with their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Cut them diagonally. And why are they going to do it? How long does it take to change the culture? I can't remember. Do you know why that culture changes? Because it's the favorite ant. See, it doesn't change if it's the loser ant. It doesn't change if it's the average ant. It changes because it's the favorite ant. If you find your school culture taking three to five to seven years, do you know who you got running the school? The wrong ant. And you'd better figure out the skills of those people in terms of what to do. That's what your Sam's there for, to help you be that right ant. How do you put that time and energy in? It's so funny. I talk about being in classrooms every day, and I'd have a principal who'd go, Todd, I don't have time. Kids get sent to the office. And I go, can I tell you a secret? If a kid gets sent to the office, do you know what that student is? The least important student in the school. Quit making them out to be the most important student in the school. If I have 740 kids in my school and one kid's sitting in the office, do you know who I spend time with? The 739 not sitting in the office. There's not a teacher in that school in a hurry to get that kid back anyhow now, are they? <laughs> and you know what's really weird? If I'm out working with the teachers and the kids and I'm building the teachers and kids skill, can I tell you a secret? It's a lot less likely that another kid will get sent to the office. And if I don't build the skill, think of it as a substitute teacher. How many of you do not have an overabundance of top quality kickbang substitutes? How many of you have had a last minute loser sub? You know, you're there, somebody wants you, that's a last minute loser sub. You have a choice with the last minute loser sub. I can either be in their classroom five minutes every hour, or I can sit down in the office and wait for the class to explode and kids get sent to the office who have never been sent to the office before. What happens with a last minute loser sub is a high speed thing of what happens with a, a, an average or below average teacher. Folks, you wanna improve your school? Do me one other favor here. You wanna get all teachers to be like the best teachers? How many of you get student teachers in your schools? Can I tell you a secret? You know what most principals do? They assign them on a rotational basis. And you're gonna tell me you don't, but you do. You can't even give a student teacher to an average teacher. You know why? You've ruined their career. We punish people like this, it's crazy. If your best teacher gets a student teacher in one week, what does that student teacher act like? In five years, what does that student teacher act like? At their point in their career now, 25 years, what does that student teacher act like? And if you put them with an average teacher, what does that student teacher act like? And what do they act like now? And we're going, what's wrong with this university? What's wrong with the teacher preparation program? Do you see the difference there? Put them with great, why would you do that? And you're going, well, what, what if a crummy teacher, that's what you want to do with crummy teachers, to give them a student teacher and give them even more free time. Isn't that what you do? <laughs> Haven't they fired out plenty of time to get for crate and barrel already? I mean, let's just be honest here. Do you know why people are in your business? Because they don't have enough business themselves. Make sure they have, my worst teachers were always in charge of the Christmas party. I couldn't put them in charge of the math curriculum because they'd have gone back to Gazintas. <laughs> Four Gazinta 16 and five Gazinta 25, I'm just telling you. <laughs> Folks, you know delegation. You ha you're, you're experts at delegation. You delegate anything anyone else can do because there are certain things only you can do. But you know who you delegate them to? the people that can only do those things. Don't ever ask your best secretary to fold and staple. Ask the loser to fold and staple. Because if you don't ask the loser to fold and staple, they don't do anything. And if you ask your best secretary to fold and staple, you keep them from doing the things only they can do. You know what I tweeted the other day? The problem with leadership isn't that we ask ineffective people to do important things. The problem is we ask effective people to do unimportant things. Have your worst teachers do the Christmas party. And how do you get them to do it? You go to them in August, long before, individually in their classroom in August during the teacher preparation days, and you go, what would you think about being part of the P uh, Christmas party planning committee? It's just you and them. They're hemming and hawing because they don't want to do anything at all. And they're going, I don't know. I go, well, it's not till December. There's a bunch of people on it. What would you think? I don't know. I go, well, we have another choice. You could also be part of the curriculum mapping committee. It meets on a series of Saturdays. I don't know which one fits your schedule better. 
Well, ho, ho, ho to you too. And I get my three worst teachers. And you know when I talk about this? Every faculty meeting, I talk for 30 seconds about the Christmas party. The very first faculty meeting, I go, how many of you are already here in Jingle Bells? How many of you are doing that? Walmart's got all their stuff up already. Uh, I was gonna say Sam's Club, I assume you all are free members. Anyhow. Um, uh, I can get you the biggest jar of peanut butter you ever seen in your life. I'm just letting you know that right there. Anyhow. First faculty meeting, I go, how many of you would like this year's Christmas party to be the best ever? Let's see a show of hands right now. How many of you would like, we have a kickbang committee. We've got Cheryl, we've got Roger, we've got Downer Donnie, uh, Don, uh, Don, Donna Downer right over there. Um, uh, do you all have a report at this time? Okay, if you have any ideas for the Christmas party, would you like to have reindeer rides, genuine elves? If you think it'd be neat if every teacher got a free iPad, I mean, whatever that is, get your ideas to them. Let's hear it for the Christmas party planning committee. Let's hear it for that, everybody. It's amazing. Where's the pressure? And you know why I put them in charge of the Christmas party planning committee? Because if the Christmas party's terrible, we still have school the next Monday. <laughs> but if the math curriculum's terrible, we don't have school the next Monday. But I don't punish my good teachers and put them on the Christmas party planning committee, because then I put them on everything, and I need to free them up to do the things only they can do instead of the things that everyone can do. You want to change the world, do one little favor to me. You start this tomorrow, you will change your school in a week. You know what it is? Start treating people as if they were good. You know why you treat people as if they were good? Because good people like it and bad people don't. And instead, you know what happens? We treat people as if they were bad. And you know the problem with that is bad people like it and good people don't. And you know why we do this? Because that's the way we get treated all the time. We treat people as if they were bad because we get treated as if we were bad. Y'all ever gone in a store, given a store clerk a $20 bill, the clerk takes out a pen and marks it to see if it's real? How gross is that? It's even your cousin. <laughs> you know, they're going, hey, Phyllis, and marking your 20. Isn't that amazing? And every time a clerk does that, you know what I ask the clerk? You've been getting a lot of counterfeit 20s around here lately? <laughs> and you know what every clerk I've ever asked has told me? We've never had a one. I go, but I guess you'll just keep insulting people till you do now, won't you? <laughs> I don't know about you, I feel completely defenseless. The only thing I can do is when they give me my change back is I take out my pen and I mark it. <laughs> and then I bite the quarter to see if it's real. I mean, I figure that's all I got. <laughs> you know why I learned this about treating people as if they were good? I learned this at our church. We got a lady who goes to our church, everybody hates her guts. Um, <laughs> and we're not a real loving church. I'm kind of letting you know that. It's a, it's a non-denominational, it's a, a church of the unshaven goat. Um, <laughs> pretty sure there's a Fort Lauderdale branch. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure there is. I know there's one in Cleveland for my Cleveland friends here, anyhow. First Sunday, I know there's one in Springfield, Illinois. I was just in Decatur. I went through there. I could, I could hear it now. First Sunday I went to church, there's a lady sitting there with like eight empty pews around her. Kind of ticked me off because they were the deluxe pews. So I go in and I snuggle in right next to her, and I can tell she does not like this at all, which is halfway stimulating to me. <laughs> and the cutest little couple you ever seen in your life come walking in church. It's like an 85-year-old man and his 84-year-old wife. They are adorable. It's their first Sunday, too, I can tell by the way they're looking around. The man's necktie matches his wife's dress. They are so cute. As soon as I saw them, I wanted to just run up and start tickling them. <laughs> I did, but, but I knew at their age. <laughs> if I did, they were, they were. They, 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 they were just going to start peeing. So anyway, they come in. <laughs> they don't know where to sit. They sit right by this lady, too. She does not like this at all. As soon as they sit down, do you know what this lady does? She turns and she just starts staring at them. She just starts staring at them. And do you know the only thing I could hope was they didn't notice? Isn't that sad? It's a dang church. It's their first Sunday. They're the cutest thing you ever see in your life. And all I can hope is they don't notice somebody's treating them with disrespect. How many of you have ever had a meeting with yourself and a teacher and a parent on the way the teacher behaves? You hope the parent doesn't notice? How about faculty meetings? Do any of you have negative people that uh, sit together in the back near the door? I'm asking random questions here. 
Folks, in a great principal school, nothing ever happens randomly. If you have a group of negative people sitting together in the back near the door, who are the most comfortable people in the room? They are, and who knows it? Everybody, and you know whose fault that is? Yours, don't ever question that. How many have teachers that grade papers or do Sudokus or knit during the meeting? <laughs> and you know which teachers it is? It's only the teachers that would never allow their students to do it in their classroom. And somebody better work with teachers on this. But you gotta know exactly how to say it. Don't say something random, because if you do it, then you're weaker and they're stronger, and that's so important. With our crummy people, you're blessed. If you missed a chance today, you'll get another crack tomorrow. I mean, you really will, it's a, it's a blessing. Everybody in our church is afraid of this lady. I'm afraid, of, I'm assuming she must be packing heat. That's all I can think of. <laughs> Ministers afraid of this lady. You know another thing that ticks me off about this lady? Because of this lady, we've gone to gluten-free communion bread. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you, I like a little gluten in my communion bread, I do. <laughs> On communion Sunday, I bring this gluten dip and I just smear my <laughs> bread right, I pass it down the pew, my pew. Palm Sunday, we were snorting the stuff. I mean, we were ready to go right there, let me just tell you. Everybody in our church is afraid of this lady. I'm afraid of this lady. You know the only difference between me and everybody else in that church? I don't act like I'm afraid of this lady. That's it. I am. I just don't act like it. You know what I do when she comes walking into church? I seek her out. And you know how I treat her? As if she's good. Do you know why? Because she can't stand it. She comes walking, I go, hey, smoke a pie, how you doing over there? Good, 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 good. She now runs for me like I'm a dog in heat trying to rub on her leg right there, let me tell you. She just sits in the back pew of the church just twitching, we got a church back there. And you know why that's treating people as if they were good? The lady in our church is about 75. What do you think the other 75-year-old women in our church think when I go up and give them a little hug and tell them how pretty they look? What do you think they think? They love it. They seek me out. If I'm not there, they'll go up to my wife and go, would you mention to Todd I wore that purple sweater? <laughs> One time he'd indicated lavender is his favorite color. When that man mountain comes walking and complaining about Mr. Lumpa, he ain't fair, he ain't fair. Never want my boy seeing Mr. Lumpa again. He ain't fair. Suspended him three days. He ain't fair. You know what I tell that parent? I go, tell me what happened. He tells me, I go, I don't, this doesn't sound fair. What's the parent think? I go, this doesn't sound fair at all. I go, matter of fact, your son never has to see Mr. Lumpa again. I go, as a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and rescind the suspension. What's the parent thinking? <laughs> dang right, dang right. I go, as a matter of fact, what I'll do is I'll just take over the discipline from your son from now on because this doesn't sound fair at all, and I'm very sorry about this because I know you're concerned about this. It sounds like to me it should have been a five-day suspension. <laughs> Folks, there cannot be snark. You cannot outsmart Alec a smart Alec. There can never be. The three things we never do, if you've read Dealing with Double, I mean, what great teachers do different? We never argue, we never yell, and we never use sarcasm. Never. Those are accelerants. You don't do it with people. You don't do it with normal people, much less abnormal people, let me tell you. I go, because it sounds like to me, Mr. Lumpa bent over backwards to help your son since it was the start of the school year, but I know you're concerned about fair. So what you'll do is you go ahead and take your son home, I'll investigate this and I'll give you a call because it sounds like it should have been a five-day suspension. Who does that parent think is the fairest person he's ever met in his life? <laughs> that parent comes walking into school. Who's afraid to see who now? And no one's ever talked to that parent that nice. Just understand that. I'm not going to put up with this nonsense, but I've got to figure out how to get it to stop. Finger pointing doesn't work. That's an accelerant. They love that. A couple things you need to know. With crummy people, with negative people, there's two things you always do. One thing you always do with negative people is you do something called the sidle up. You approach negative people from the side. Excellent transition on your part. When I wrote the book Shifting the Monkey, I talk about sidling up, and my spell check said sidle isn't a word. But I think something's wrong with my spell check because it also says irregardless isn't a word, and I'm positive it is. I've been using that one for years. Do you know where you learn to deal with adults? Watch your best teacher and see how they deal with the kids. Because your best teacher treats the kids more like adults than anybody else in the school does. So why don't you treat them like that? What does the best teacher do? How do they approach kids every day? From the side. Every kid they approach from the side. Hi, did you have any questions on that homework? Did number nine make any sense? Did you get a chance to do that? The worst teacher in your school, the 178 out of 180 days, they're in a bad mood. How do they approach the kids? Line in the sand. Line in, do you want to teach? 
do you want to take the chocolate teeth? Would you like to take the chocolate teeth? Why don't you take the chocolate teeth? You want to take the chocolate teeth? And they hold the chalk, one inch away from the kid, hoping the kid will pull the chalk out of their hand so they can send the kid to the office and pull the chalk out of their hand. How many of you know teachers? How many of you know teachers that stop teaching and challenge two kids in the middle of the room? And I'm not talking about challenging them intellectually. I'm not talking, you know what I mean? I don't mean that. I mean, I'm sorry, did you two have something you wanted to say? Was what you had to say more important than what we all had to say? Who did I decide were the most important kids in the class? Who are the least important kids in the class? Somebody teach your teachers this. Teach your teachers this. It's amazing. It changes their behavior. They do it because they don't know any better. You know why? Because the person they student taught with does that. Because of the fact that the teacher and the side of them. My daughter Madeline went to Vanderbilt, graduated with seven people in the College of Education, seven. She student taught with the head of the union in Nashville Public Schools. My daughter Madeline told me, goes, Dad, I grew up with you and mom. I've read your books. Dad, I know what's right and wrong. And my second day as a student teacher, I almost yelled. Madeline won't yell as a teacher if she teaches 50 years because she knows it's wrong. But do you understand the culture that they put her in? And this is Madeline. And Madeline's the strongest person I've ever known in my life. And we do this stuff all the time. And it's just crazy. Start treating people as if they were good. You know another thing that drives me crazy? It's when crummy people threaten to quit and people talk them out of it. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? <laughs> Don't quit. Don't quit. What? They're horrible. <laughs> They're so bad I call them two partiers. If they'd quit, you'd throw two parties, one for them and one for you. You know exactly what I'm talking about here. And you know my favorite thing they threaten to do? I love this. You tell me if it's true in your part of the country. There's no way I can know this. Here's my favorite thing they threaten to do. You know what? I might just quit and go become a greeter at Walmart. You know what I always tell them? That there's no way. They will never hire you. I mean, <laughs> they, their standards are low, but they're not that low. <laughs> oh, you're thinking of their standards for customers. Walmart has no standards for customers. You ever question that? Just Google, what do Walmart customers wear? <laughs> you will not eat for three months. I'm just letting you know that. You look at those pictures, and you know what comes to mind? Apparently, a fishnet's back. <laughs> and on some of those people, some of that fishnet's got some pretty dang big holes in it, doesn't it? <laughs> and on some of those people, there's a lot of them that'll slide through just one of those holes. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> Folks, you want to change the culture in your school? Look at the climate of your school today, and I want you to think, how do the different people in your school greet the kids. How do the cooks greet the kids? How do the custodians greet the kids? How do the principals greet the kids? How do the teacher's assistants? How do the secretaries? How do the uh, uh, teachers greet? The, how do they greet the kids? Average teachers, not, gra not crummy, not great. Average teachers. Not the first day of school when they're still happy and perky. Not the last day of school when they're ready to pee their pants. How do the average teachers greet their kids? How do they greet their kids? Hey. Happy Friday, TGIF, and the G stands for goodness, not God. Good to see you. How's it going? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> how do the great teachers greet the kids? And by the way, when I say how do the great teachers greet the kids, you know what's weird? I don't have any qualifiers. I didn't say it depends on time of day, day of week. It doesn't depend on last uh, class size. It doesn't depend on what time of the day it is. It doesn't depend on when the last vacation was or when the next vacation is. Great people have the ability to do this every single day. Great people have the ability to do it 10 days out of 10. Folks, you can't change the culture by changing the climate nine days out of 10. You can't change the culture by treating people as if they were good nine days out of 10. Lots of people do it nine days out of 10. If a, if a great teacher's in a bad mood, how many people in that class know that great teacher's in a bad mood? One, the teacher. If, a bad, if an average teacher, average, is in a bad mood, how many people know it? And your crummy ones, announce it. Have you ever seen that? They announce it the whole school. I'm in a bad mood today. <laughs> don't try me. I said, don't try me. How many of you know people like this? Somebody, 
understand, you have to be people's interpersonal intelligence. The people that can figure it out on their own have already figured it out on their own. When you went around and met yourself, when, and Mark had you go and introduce yourself to somebody, how many of you met somebody you like? How many of you met somebody you might like? How many of you met somebody you might like better than the dang people you came to the conference with? I'll just be honest here now. <laughs> how many of you work with people that other people say, can't they tell nobody likes them? Do you know what the answer to that question is? No, they can't. You've got to be their interpersonal intelligence. You have to give people guidance. It can't be in a negative way. You have to lead them down the correct path. Otherwise, what happens is they get confused in terms of that. You ever work with anybody other people say, can't they tell nobody likes them? Understand, nobody ever likes them. People have the exact same interpersonal skills at work that they have or don't have away from work. If you work with somebody who gripes and whines and complains all the time at work, you all want to know a secret? Away from work, their nickname is not Chuckles. I'm just letting you know that right there. How do your great teachers greet the kids every single day? How do they do it? hi -oh! How you doing today? Headbutt, high five, how's it going? Did you get a new sweater? I like that haircut. Did you get a new project? Is that your notebook? What do you think about the games this weekend? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? I don't know what's going to go on in New England. They seem pretty uns insurmountable. I don't know, but I don't know about anybody else. I don't mind if Atlanta wins because we have some uh, Falcons fans here in the stands. Okay. Uh, everybody, get on in here, get on in here, get on in here, get on in here. You know what that great teacher is? Do you know what that great teacher is? Do you know what that great teacher is? The teacher you wish was greeting your child. That's who that great teacher is. And folks, look at the professionals in this room. And I heard people in this room right now make fun of that great teacher. In this room right now. You know that great teacher? Somebody's had too much caffeine. <laughs> Somebody who's got something wrong with them. You do know average people hope it's the great teachers that have something wrong with them. Because they know one of the two of them has something wrong with them. And if it's not the great teacher, they're out of options. Do you know why great teachers are so positive? Because they compare themselves to people who are less fortunate than them. Do you know why most people are so negative? Because they compare themselves to people who are more fortunate than them. Great teachers compare themselves to people who have a larger class size. But even if they compare themselves to people who have a smaller class size, you know what they think? Good, I get to influence more students this year. Your average people only compare themselves to people who have a smaller class size than, than they do. They only compare themselves to people who get paid more than they do. Snow days. Choose a dang team. How many of you know somebody who's mad when there isn't a snow day and mad when they make one up? I mean, choose a team. <laughs> and teach your teachers this. Folks, the other thing you have to understand, great teachers, great principals, great parents, great Sams have lots in common. You know one thing they have in common? An incredible ability to ignore. Poor teachers, poor principals, poor parents, poor Sams have no ability to ignore whatsoever. Ignore is not ignorant, ignore is not unaware. Ignore means I choose to respond or not to respond to something that's taking place. You all are students in the classroom. I go, hey, you all are talking, I'm the teacher. I go, hey gang, let's be quiet. Don't students have a whole variety of responses? Some students say sorry and stop talking. Some students, just stop talking. And some students say, we weren't the only ones talking. <laughs> what does a great teacher have literally an unlimited ability to do? Ignore. What does the worst teacher have no ability to do whatsoever? What does the worst teacher do? Yeah, but you're the ones I was talking to. And they continue to accelerate that. Why do I bring this up, folks? Because understand this. How many of you in your school have teachers that when they get upset, they whine? How many of you live with whiners? Those of you who live with whiners, how many of you have told them this is a three-week old conference? I'm just asking here. <laughs> we'll cover for you on Twitter. Day one done, 20 more to go. <laughs> Hashtag conference that never ends. Understand this. <laughs> how many of you work with some people that when they get upset, they pout? Make me projectile vomit. They pout. And do you know why they pout? Do you know why they whine? I know why your whiners whine. I know why your powders pout. Do you all know why your whiners whine and why your powders pout? It's not because they can, it's not because that's all they know, it's not because you let them, it's not because they're upset, it's not because they don't feel valued. Do you know why whiners whine and powders pout? Because it works. Do you know when whiners whine and powders will stop pouting when it doesn't work? How many of you work with a cereal powder? <laughs> that's not somebody who's upset about their frosted flakes, that's somebody whose go-to is the pout. But they only pout when it's a huge deal. For example, how can you blame them? For example, no wonder they're offended. For example, someone, you talk about nerves, someone, this is incredible, someone, Ha! Parked in their parking place. Oh, my land. How many have emotionally reserved parking at your schools? 
Folks, we only emotionally reserve things for losers. I didn't know if y'all knew that or not. Because normal people don't throw fits. You wonder if your pouting works, if you wonder if whining works, who has the smallest class size of anybody in your school, who has the easiest caseload, who never gets the most challenging students, who does no extracurricular work, and who do we never ask to be on any committee? We keep that up, these people will never quit. I'm just letting you know that right there. If somebody parks in an average teacher, not even great, average teacher's parking place, what does the average teacher do? Park somewhere else, and who do they tell? No one, teacher teachers this. This is even what average teachers do. How many of you are in communities that potentially parents and students will cross paths with teachers during the summer? Okay, 4th of July parade, middle of the summer, 4th of July picnic. Walking across the lawn is the best teacher in the school. They cross paths with a student and prospective student. We're the filter, folks. We have a choice of what comes out of your mouth and what doesn't. You better teach your teachers this, because some of them are never gonna figure this out on their own. They're the filter. When people say, how's your day going? Do you know what you say? Great, how are you? How does that help you not to say great? How does that not? You're a principal, you got a whack job parent, Mrs. Smith, in your office. You cannot get her out of your office. She is a jackknob. You cannot get her out of your office. <laughs> Finally, you pull out a crowbar and you wedge her out of your office. You walk out in the hallway and the teacher goes, hey, how's your day going? What do you say? Great, how are you? How does that help anybody if you go, oh, that Mrs. Smith, that Mrs. Smith. Every teacher who has a kid named Smith is now scared to death. Every teacher who has a kid named Smythe is now scared to death. And every teacher who has a kid who has a step-parent, the step-parent's last name is different than the kids, and they don't know the step-parent's last name is now scared to death, just in case there's any chance the step-parent's last name is? That best teacher crosses paths with a respective student and their parent on the 4th of July. The student and parent go, hey, you ready for school to start? What does that best teacher say? Oh, yeah, looking forward to it. Was just putting up my bowling boards this morning. I cannot wait. I sure hope I get you. I loved your nine cousins. That was so fun when I had all them. <laughs> Counting down the days. That parent and student walk a little farther, and they cross paths with the worst teacher in the school, and everybody else falls somewhere in between, don't they? Somebody better teach your teachers this. They cross paths with the worst teacher in the school, and they go, hey, you ready for school to start? What's the worst teacher say? No, no, no. You know what that parent's thinking? Oh, my land. I wish my children could be transferred into your classroom. What a double-decker pleasure bus. That must be each and every day right there, let me tell you. <laughs> you know what else that parent's thinking? Did, 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 did you know I work 12 months and you, you work nine? Did you know I pay your salary? Did you know your salary's higher than mine? Folks, people don't mind giving teachers raises. Teach your teachers. They just don't want to give the loser a raise. Understand this. They're happy to give teachers raises. They just don't want to give the losers a raise. And that's important to understand this. How many of you work with a couple teachers who don't even greet the kids? How many work with a couple teachers who don't even make eye contact? How many work with a couple teachers who don't even smile? How many of you went and introduced yourself to somebody they didn't even smile? And they only had to, they even chose you. I mean, think about that. <laughs> some of your losers, some of your negative people do greet the kids, don't they? How do they greet the kids? Hey, better sit down, better get started. Clip up, clip down, put your name on the board, send it to the office, put you on the hallway. You know what they're saying? Welcome to the torture chamber. <laughs> Have a contest in your school to see which, kid in your sc which teacher in your school can fake greeting the kids the happiest the rest of this year. Because can I tell you a secret? Your best teacher's been fake and greeting them for seven years. You might as well understand that. And that's so important. Folks, you change the climate today. You never change it back, and you change the culture forever. I need you to do me a selfish favor. I need everybody to stand up. Totally selfish favor. Stand up, please. Totally stand up. Completely selfish favor. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, I want you to throw your hands up in the air and yell hallelujah. Okay, everybody ready? Everybody understand what I'm asking you to do? Everybody ready? Everybody ready? One, two, three, hallelujah! One, two, three, hallelujah! One, two, three, hallelujah! Thanks so much, sit back down. I need to explain why I asked you to do this. My mom is 92. You're gonna, you're gonna have to clap louder than that. She can't hear that good. But anyhow, uh, my mom's doing great. She takes no medicines. She does not wear glasses. 
My mom dropped out of school after eighth grade because the closest school was 27 miles away, the closest high school. She grew up in rural Kansas. My mom every day does the New York Times crossword puzzle in pen at 92. We lost my dad 15 years ago, so we moved my mom down the street from us. My mom's doing a great, she's dating a guy 93. <laughs> she, she totally has it made, let me tell you. It's her third boyfriend since we've lost my dad. My mom's outlived the other two, and the other day we heard this guy coughing, so we may be looking for a number. <laughs> number four here pretty soon, anyhow. My mom's doing great. When I'm in town, I check on her every day. I'm done working out at six in the morning. I stop by her house. Dag Nabbit, she's out running around. Can I tell you a little secret? If your mom's 92 and it's six in the morning and she's out running around, did you know there's no downside to that? The downside is if she's no longer running around. Well, I didn't get a chance to check on her today, so I'm gonna call her and she has this little map and knows where I'm at and she thinks it's the cutest thing in the world. So I get to the airport, I'm gonna call her, I'm going, Mom, uh, I, I got done there and she, my mom's gonna go, Todd, how'd things go down there in Fort Lauderdale, Florida? I'm gonna say, Mom, I ain't saying they went well. But those dang people were standing up, throwing their hands in the air, and y'all in hallelujah. So I appreciate y'all doing that for me. Y'all have a great conference. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You are terrific. Thank you My so pleasure. Much. Thank you.